Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today I'm thrilled to be talking to the always wonderful Tom Ellis about his latest film, Players. And in starting to talk about how you developed and shaped your character for this movie, I was interested in kind of the gift that the script gave you in terms of details about your character, because in essence, Gina Rodriguez's character, Mac, and her friends do all of this recon and research on him. And so as you were going through the script, did you find it quite helpful to look at, you know, what's their objective perspective of him? What are the details that they're finding about him to start building him out? Yeah, I mean, there was there was there was clues for sure in the script as to like who this person was. I I was really um, my objective, I think, was because as you read it, you realised, oh, he's a bit of a douche. Like he really does love himself quite a lot, but he doesn't let that on in the first instance. So I think trying to find that trying to find that journey through it was was my biggest challenge, I suppose, and trying to make him feel like why would Mac want to be with this character? Um, and it's not just about, you know, the way that he looks or his nice apartment or anything like that. What is it about him that she likes? And then what is it that slowly erodes over the time that they're together and then the real him, you know, comes out? And I think I think that was the challenge. But I, I, I it was weird. I, I, there was people that I, in my head, I was like, oh, I think I've met people like this. Like, I know, I know this type of character. Um... And I, I had recently, before I got the script, actually, I listened to this thing. Um, it's an old, on Radio 4, there's a thing in the UK called Desert Island Discs. And each week they invite someone, you know, who's in the public eye to talk about their life and what, what eight tracks they would take with them to a desert island. Anyway, there was a guy on it called Jeremy Bowen, <clears throat> who was a really famous war correspondent from the BBC. And um, it was a really interesting interview because obviously we only see one side of these people on camera and this heroic kind of, you know, images that they have and they're in these war-torn countries and there's chaos around them and they're being super brave and they're talking about super important things. But behind all of it, there is still ego and there is still this want to be seen in those places and this want for people to to kind of think good things about them. Um, and so I, I, it was, it was interesting to sort of find that, that inner ego for him and find the moments where that would start to come out and the real him would come out and the self-importance would come out. And, um, yeah, there was clues in that script, but it took a little bit of work as well. And and how did you find those moments where you wanted the, the cracks of the veneer to start coming through? Because I think that's such a great point about, you know, he's this dashing romantic love interest at the beginning, but then we realize that it's not necessarily the compatibility that we thought at first. I think for me, it was, it was about, it's when it, people like that, it's, it's not that they're ever trying to be mean or horrible or dismissive or anything like that. They do it without thinking. And they do it under the assumption that everyone else in the world, you know, thinks that they are more intelligent than they are. And um, I think that the, the, there were certainly moments in the film where I always wanted to underplay those moments in a way where it's, it's like an offhand remark that you don't think there's any comeback to it. But actually, you don't realise how hurtful that thing is that you've just said or done. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and we see a lot of moments with him throughout the film where he's kind of he's in his his space in terms of where he really thrives. But then through the relationship with Mac, we also get to see the places where he doesn't quite connect with other people in the right way. You know, he's sitting there while people are making Star Wars references and he's like, well, I never watched these movies. And he's not adept as sports as a team player. Um, so how did you kind of enjoy finding those like fallibilities and the places where he's really outside of his comfort zone and where maybe he does struggle to connect with other people a little bit? Uh, th those were the moments I had the most fun, actually. There's a scene in it where we go for brunch on a double date, and th it, 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 I really enjoyed that because I, you know, Nick was totally uncomfortable in that scenario because he probably thinks he's better than everyone else. And uh, um, the, the, playing that kind of uh, Hyperion sort of status, but um, but trying to, you know, trying to feel like you're fitting in, that's where the comedy comes from, I think. Um, yeah, it was it was it was great fun. It really was.
And with that scene, there, there's reference to he doesn't share food because, you know, he's he's conscious that someone might try to poison him because he's covered politically corrupt regimes. And did you buy that as like that is genuinely a serious thing that he has to worry about? Or that's just kind of the pomp and circumstance that he's creating for himself? I think there's a bit of, I think there's a bit of both. I don't think anyone's ever attempted to take his life. But I think that maybe he's heard that in his travels along the way. And so he's like, oh, I'm having that. But and it might be more that he doesn't share food for other reasons. Like he's a little germaphobe or, you know, he's got, uh, I don't know, he's got something about uh, like a, a sound issue with someone's chewing or whatever. But it's, um, I, I think that he's he's very good at making himself self-important, like that kind of humble brag. Um, and I think that that's, that's certainly one of his um, tools that he uses in life for sure. Do you think he cares when he makes those humble brags and it kind of goes other, over other people's heads? Because there's a moment where he makes reference to like, oh, I've had worse cell phone service in Baghdad and that's not going to click with anyone around him. But again, it's his way of showing showing his yeah. pomp and circus. Look at me, look at what I've done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just It's like someone who name drops all the time, except he's just life dropping about, oh, they're, they're, yeah, this time I was in Gaza. Um, yeah, it's like, it's, you know, it's uh, it, it was... It was a, a it was a fun character to approach in that way because he takes himself seriously, and anyone that takes himself seriously is great fun to take the piss out of. So um, yeah, that that was very much my kind of like modus operandi for him for sure. And he he definitely, as you said, takes himself very seriously. But I also love the kind of getting to see that come off when he's at the batting cage and he's oh, yeah. there baseball bat. And that was quite a great scene for you in terms of just the physical comedy. Um, and so what was the experience of just finding the physical comedy of a character that's usually so buttoned up? I think, I mean, the, the, that that scene took no time at all to shoot. It was really funny. Gina and I rocked up on a Friday evening. I think it was the last thing to shoot that day. And they'd set it all up and they just was like, go for it. So those reactions are all pretty genuine, to be honest. Um, it, I mean, it was, it wasn't playing it for comedy, but like when you've got those balls flying at you at those speed, it's like, just, just see what happens. Um, so That's your natural skill level at, at baseball. It was a nice opportunity to get a little cricket reference in there as well about it. They're not even bounce. Um, it was, yeah, it was, it was good fun. I, I love doing moments like that where you're just allowed to kind of go for it basically. And there's reference to his dating life as well, kind of going back to the research that the other characters do on him, where they're like, okay, he goes on a date with someone every seven to nine days. He doesn't really do second dates. He doesn't really let people get close to him. Um, and so for you, what did that tell you about the character in terms of, you know, he wants to have some sort of connectivity with people, but maybe struggles to be quite intimately close with people? Oh, yeah. I mean, again, when I was thinking about that interview that I'd heard with the war correspondent, he talks about the sort of lonely existence that that is and how taxing that is on your on your personal life and your nearest and dearest, um, but how it can be very addictive as well. So I think that he, you know, Nick is someone who's quite happy to, you know, just play the field, um, but really no interest in sharing um, in the true sense of the word. Um, so yeah, I think he's someone who's incredibly intelligent, but emotionally stunted. Right. And it, it feels like he lives in a world where he's quite adulated in his circles and through kind of stepping outside of that part of how Mac kind of gets him on the hook is by ignoring that and not doing that. Um, and so what, what was that sense of intrigue that starts to develop when she's like, oh, you're doing a reading of your new book and like, oh, I haven't read the last one. I didn't realize that you hadn't written another one yet. I think that just, uh, that, that for Nick becomes like a challenge in his head. You know, people that operate like that, it's like, oh, you don't understand how impressive I am. I'm gonna show you how impressive I am. Um, I think that it just spurns him on even more. I and mean, People want what they can't have. And I think, you know, he's very used to people just kind of falling at his feet. And when someone pretends not to do that, it just makes him even more intrigued. So it's a very good tactic on Mac's part, I would suggest. And when we see his apartment, you know, the, the artifacts around his home are very much from his travels and, and from his international work. And so they kind of give you this little story map to him as well. So what was that like when you've kind of first walked onto set and started to kind of see a lot of those details piecing together? Oh, I thought it was cool. It was really funny. I had a really good chat with the art department because they, they were asking me about various things that you think he would have in his apartment and artifacts and all that. And then the thing that I really loved, and we never actually talked about it in the movie, but like... It was, there's, there's always something in a job where you either put on a bit of clothing or something and you're like, oh, there's the character. 
And we gave Nick this chain around his neck that had an old like coin on it. And I just, I, for my own head, I'd like had this story that like he likes to talk about this. And this is, was given to him by a father in Syria of a daughter, of because I saved his daughter. And, um, you know, it's just this very sort of self-important artifact that is very purposely placed there to start a conversation should it ever come up. I mean, I, I love how those sorts of details are always kind of really key to you finding character. And I remember you talking very specifically about how shoes have always been a big thing for you, like right. once you put the character's shoes on. Um, and so was that the same with this character in terms of just some of the outfits that he wears and even just physically putting on his shoes for the first time? I think so. I mean, like obviously with this, like it was much more, you know, Nick wears normal clothes as opposed to like Lucifer wearing suits all the time or whatever. But um, I think just that sense just a sense of someone who sort of takes pride in his appearance and someone who, you know, wants to be seen to be attractive without making too much effort and all of those things. There were just things that sort of were bubbling and simmering for me while we were doing it, for sure. And was it kind of fun to play around with like the, the anxiety and stress of the character as well, because he's going through the process of trying to write his next book. You know, there's always the, the self-doubt that creeps in that he doesn't want to show the world, but we kind of see these little snippets of it. Yeah. No, again, it was that was just another element of like, you know, what, what makes him tick. And I think someone who's sort of talking about, oh, I can't do this. I've got this deadline, blah, blah, blah. They're also that they also would love someone to say, oh, can I give it a read? Oh, okay, oh, yeah. OK, have, have a little read of it. Like he wants people to, to know these things, but he has to play the oh, I'm not so sure the humble brag card again. It's like, oh, you know, the self-deprecation, but he's not really self-deprecating. It's just a tool that he uses. And as much as the cracks that appear in their relationship come, you know, in part from him, there's also the element of Mac has been presenting a version of her, herself to him to try and lure him that isn't all true or things that she's kind of not fully giving over. Like she lies and says she has a brother at one point for a move that she's making on him. And then it turns out she doesn't at all. Um, and so how did you and Gina kind of set about figuring out the way that the relationship can kind of go into this space of breakdown where it's like, nobody's done anything heinously wrong. It's just that intimacy and that closeness and that truthfulness just isn't quite there between them. I think, you know, they're, they're, when there are moments that really mean something to a character and they are either dismissed or overlooked by the other character, those are the, those are the moments where the story really starts to shift. And so there was just little, little bits and pieces in the script of Nick being just quietly dismissive and patronizing or, you know, um, just, I, I hate to use that word again, but Hyperion, he just feels like he's better than the other people. Um, so it was just picking those moments out in the script basically and, um, and, and running with them at the time. But like working with Gina was a dream. Gina is just, she's so, she's so good. She's so instinctively, her instincts are great. And certainly her instincts for comedy as well are really, really strong. Um, and so, I don't know, we just we just had a lot of fun with it. Like, I hate to use the old adage, just have fun with it, but we really did, you know, we were encouraged to come off script sometimes when we felt we had, you know, what was on the page. Um, and I think you do that a lot when you're shooting comedy, um, just to give it some kind of fresh impetus and some fresh jokes um, and some surprising moments. And it doesn't always get used, but there are little bits and pieces that get put into it. And it's just, it adds those extra textures in the final cut. No, you're, you're so right about, you know, her skill when it comes to comedy, but for, for you in finding the comedy of your performance for this movie, was it kind of going back to that idea that you said earlier on of just playing for the comedy of, to him, everything is deadly serious and he is fully invested in everything that he says? Yeah, I mean, the, my my role you know in the in the science of comedy my role in this was to be, to be the straight man um and to be the straight man you have to take you know everything has to be serious for you otherwise you could you know that's not it. so it wasn't my job to go and be funny there are funny moments that i'm involved in but um it was never a kind of like playing it for laughs character it's kind of the laugh is that this character is very serious is there a difference in the way that you have to approach comedy depending on what that stylistic approach is? Because, you know, thinking back to Lucifer, where he was more the forefront of the comedy, but then things like this and, and Miranda, you're more of the straight guy, like you were saying. And so how does that affect the way that you're approaching to play different styles and references of comedy? 
I think as, uh, simply understanding your role, like, and I say comedy science, because when I was doing Miranda, I learned a lot from her. And she is a, you know, she is a scholar of comedy and she really knows how it works. And yes, there are, you know, you have to be funny in yourself in some regard, but for jokes to work and characters to work in a comedic setting, everyone has their role to play. And understanding that role is how you make it funny. So like if I went in there every day trying to be funny, it would have completely undermined the actual comedy and it wouldn't have been funny subsequently. So you've just got to kind of, you know, as long as I'm doing what I'm doing and you're doing what you're doing, and this is a well-written like piece, then the, the 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 equation, the comedy equation will work. But if you try and do too much or you're not fulfilling your role properly, then it will it will sink like a bad souffle. It's a great analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, also having spent so much time on Lucifer and and having that experience of being number one on the call sheet you have such an intrinsic understanding of the specific pressures, kind of the stress that comes with that, the responsibility, what you're trying to do for the rest of the cast around you. And so in working on a project like this, where, you know, you're also there in support of Gina Rodriguez as number one on the call sheet, how, how has the experience of Lucifer made you think differently about the way that you walk onto set when you're trying to support someone else in that position, knowing what they're under? Well, I think, I think, you know, it, a lot of it is on the person. Like, and Gina is a great set leader. Like, she really is. She's very generous with her time. She's very generous with um, talking about things. It's never, you know, this is my thing and you're here to serve me. Very much she's a team player. Um, players. Um, but, you know, she she is someone like me who learned how to do that by being number one on a, on a show for an extended period of time. And that is such a privileged position to be in. Um, and if you can do that and make people feel like they are part of a team and you can be kind to those people while still doing your job and, you know, getting your day moving forward and all of that, um, then then you I you are what I deem to be good at that job. And Gina is very good at that job. So it's kind of easy to be supportive in that sense because you feel like she's supporting you. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was a lovely set to be on in that regard. I love that. And also in, in terms of the work that you did on Lucifer, I mean, you had that beautiful gift of, of 93 episodes inhabiting the same character, which is such a long relationship to have in playing the same character, being so familiar with the crew, the cast around you. And so what has the experience been in the roles that you've done since then, where it's kind of pushing you back outside of your comfort zone into new spaces and new characters and, and new collaborations with people? It's terrifying. <laughs> Um, it, it, no, it is. I mean, it, it was, it was strange for me to play a character for such a long time. I've never done that before. Um, and I almost forgot what it was like to walk onto a different set. Um, and so players actually was my first job after Lucifer finished. Um, and I remember being incredibly nervous and I remember being very conscious of the fact that I didn't want Luciferisms to creep into my performance because they were so part and parcel of who I'd become in that last sort of six years. Um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time thinking about that and and thinking, gosh, I just don't, I want to be different because that's always been my thing as an actor. I want to, the next job I go on to, I want it to be vastly different from the previous one. Um, and I'd like to surprise people with range and with like playing different characters and stuff. Um, so I was, I was pretty nervous, but again, it was like, it was, it was great working with Gina because she'd had a similar experience and she had led, uh, Jane the Virgin for, you know, five or six years as well. And, and we talked about her first time walking onto a set and how she felt. And it was a very similar, you know, feeling that we'd had. And, um, I'm just glad that it was on this set because I just, you know, that, that, that probably lived with me for my first couple of days of shooting. And then I suddenly was like, oh, okay, I can breathe now. I, I trust, I'm trusting this process. And yeah, I think every every day you walk onto a new set, you're always going to be nervous. I mean, I started shooting on Tell Me Lies uh, like last week and I was incredibly nervous. 
walking onto the set um, because, you know, it's a new job and you want to impress people and you've got, you know, people now feel like they know you and their ex their expectations have gone up <laughs> and all of these things. So, yeah, there's, there's always that kind of pressure to start with, but it's a pressure that I enjoy for sure. I also love that that point that you were just talking about in terms of really wanting to find roles that are something different and, and kind of surprising in different ways. Um, because I've heard you talk in the past about this shift that you had in your career at the point where it wasn't just about going out for a job, but it was going out for the right job. And I was just interested in kind of like that journey and that trajectory over the years for you and, and kind of it's not just about landing a job as an actor. And obviously there's so much stress that comes with pursuing a career and just trying to get hired and trying to pay your bills into a place where you feel like it's really been able to be a place where you're selective about what feels like the right job, not even just because of the script, but because of the people working on it, the environment that it's going to be. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things to consider now these days when a job comes up, you know, the script is obviously a massive part of it and the people who are doing it is a massive part of it, but also personal circumstances, you know, having a family and, working out how much time you're going to be away from home and how are you going to make this work and how are you going to see people? And so there's so many elements I have to think about when stuff comes in. Um, but again, you know, it's not always been like that. I, when I first started out, it would be, I, I you know, my first few years out of drama school, the advice I got was take everything that comes your way. Um, because you can then work out for yourself what you enjoy doing, what you don't enjoy doing, where your strengths lie and where your weaknesses lie. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that I would still advise that to anyone starting. If you do get to a position where you feel like you can, you're brave enough to take the reins and your circumstances dictate that, you know, if you don't do this job, you might not work for a few months, but that's okay. Um, you know, it's, that that is a privileged position to be in. And I do feel very lucky to have gotten to that point. But I also am very open to people like, it's not always been like this. I've been doing this for 25 years. And we're talking literally about the last few years of that 25 that I've been in that position. So, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a marathon and not a sprint, this career, for sure. Yeah, it's it's definitely a gift to reach that point in your career. Yeah, no, I feel very, very blessed, for sure. Well, I always love the work that you do on screen and, and it's been so lovely to see the work that you've started to do post Lucifer and uh, look forward to seeing many more wonderful projects and characters from you. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks so much. It's nice talking to you again.